We scrutinise rod catches as a measure of angling success, um, which is quite understandable. Uh, but using rod catches as a measure of abundance has to be done with a lot more caution. And that be, can be because three of the best weeks of fishing in the year, perhaps in October, have been lost to fishing. And that can affect the, the, the catches by an order of many thousands. Or simply the, the fish uh, have returned early, which was the case in uh, 2011. And they they didn't they had a lower propensity to to take the fly. Their catchability was much less. Fish counters that are run um, properly in terms of their validation and that they're running throughout the year can provide us with that objective data to inform management decisions. And once we have that data, we wish to consider the target for spawning. What is the context to those numbers? How many fish do we need to spawn the next generation of fish? and that is our spawning target. If we get say a thousand fish back do we actually need two thousand to fully stock the numbers of juvenile fish upstream in the subsequent years from the, those spawning fish or is it an actual fact that that number is, is, is sufficient? That is the, the biological question and that leads on to the, the management question. If we have plenty of fish then we don't require catch and release and we can kill the odd salmon or there and there's not going to be any issue. If our spawning targets aren't being met then we have to be more careful with the stocks that we manage. So we'll do a run through of the fish counters of the tweed catchment and how we get to those spawning targets. Here's the distribution of fish counters in the catchment. The, 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 the counter at Philip Hoff isn't working at the moment but we do have a data series there and that has a spring sap salmon population and has potentially the largest catchment area to monitor so very important. The skin works called we think has a summer and autumn fish population and has been working since 2007 and then we've got the the fish counter at Alstrom's on the Wittadder which was installed in 2010 and has a slightly larger catchment than the Gala and that has a spring salmon population. It's always good to have a broad ge geographical distribution fish counters if it's possible but we rely in the end on physical structures to, to put in our fish counter. Technology we use are VACI infrared cameras and they rely on being installed into fish passes in narrow gaps. Here you can see the scanner plates and the infrared beams that pass across and they can be installed into a fish pass like this on the, the Murray called Selkirk. The fish pass through, they block off the diodes and the number of diodes tells you the depth of the fish. That means you can calculate the length in a basic depth to length relationship. This is what it looks like as an installation on the, the Selkirk Ettrick fish counter. And then eventually the technology caught up with the, the installation of a light tunnel which allows us to identify salmon and trout which is extremely important for apportioning the different fish otherwise we would just have a raw total without being able to split the fish up. This is the Ettrick counter. Uh, this is probably about 20 years ago and has great, uh, changed greatly. This is what it looks like now. There's been a significant amount of work and a, a larger fish pass without a fish counter in it at the moment but hopefully that will change very soon. Quite appropriately we start in black and white. That was a trout that went through the flat tail and then the salmon that go through with their distinct forked tail. The innies is the forked tail and the outies are trout. There's a 40 pound salmon that go, has gone through over a metre in length. And these are the results that we have from 1998 to 2009. A variation in numbers from about 3,100 odd fish up to 5,162. So quite a bit of variation there what is the context to those results and we'll explore spawning targets with the Gala counter yeah, shortly. This is the Wittadder counter that's the most recent installation. This is the top of a Denel fish pass and most of the fish we think go through the fish pass but some do get over the cooled face so we have to be careful with the interpretation of these results. Now we're in colour and we see lovely fresh salmon coming in as we're close to the sea fish in a 70, 80, 90 centimetre length. Uh, these are spring salmon, multi-sea winter fish. 
so there'll be two sea winters or three sea winters in some cases. These are the numbers that we've got since 2010. It was installed at the end of 2010, so this is the baseline for 2011. Not particularly variable, the numbers, 786 down to 539, but we just need to build up the baseline of data before we can come to any strong conclusions. At the moment, we're really using it to look at the effect of fresh releases from the reservoir on movements of fish. Now the Gala water, which is the, the workhorse of the fish counters at the moment. Uh, this is producing the best data and the one that we'll explore further with the spawning targets. These are definitely the best images that, that we get. Generally we have um, a lot of turbidity. There's a thin, small salmon, probably only a few pounds. Those are unusual salmon in, in that they're fresh silver fish. A lot of them uh, in September, October tend to be more coloured and difficult. Uh, it's more difficult to discern them. About half the fish we can identify going through this counter. We have the baseline of data from 2008 and the first thing of interest is that in 2014 despite the catches going down um, quite significantly numbers were bang on average uh, through the gala counter. So whether that means that the results for the gala are specific to that catchment, to, to this part of the catchment and not related to the rod catches, we really don't know I'm afraid. Also of interest is that in 2010 we had the snow melt event and we would expect that numbers would be reduced in 2012 and 2013. And the numbers were the lowest on record but weren't nearly as low as we expected. We expected perhaps only a few hundred fish to, to, to return and again it's difficult to explain that. Perhaps there was a compensatory mechanism where the few fish that did survive um, carried on and managed to get to the smolt stage and out to sea. To start investigating the context of the results we need to consider salmon uh, for their fecundity and the number of eggs that can be deposited further upstream of the counter. Not just numbers but consider the, the, the number of eggs they carried and this is related to length. And This picture just illustrates the, the different stages of development uh, for fish that were taken from smokery, um, caught rod caught fish that were taken to the smokery uh, and these fish were caught in October and November so these were fresh fish. Older fish can they can absorb their eggs and that can affect their fecundity and it shows the huge number of eggs that a 96 centimeter fish can hold. We can then define the relationship uh, with length and egg number and we have the numbers in 2011 in red and 2012 in green and it shows that there's a significant difference between the two. 2011 the fish came back early for some reason and were in extremely good condition and then in 2012 they weren't as, as in good condition but we can still put a line between the two and define the relationship. What that means then is we can produce the graph here of egg number and of particular interest we see in 2008 that the totals were highest 1954 fish yet the egg deposition was higher in 2011 and that was because I think that there were larger fish and in better condition and that led to high numbers of eggs being deposited and this demonstrates the importance of using eggs and not just numbers and size of fish and fecundity is more important now that we have those number of eggs we need to be able to compare them to the literature and in order to do that we need to know the stream bed area upstream and then the published literature on what they think should be deposited. So the first thing we need to do is calculate the area upstream and this we use using mapping technology and we come up with a figure of 364,500 square meters of stream bed upstream of the Gala water. We then go to the literature and we see quite a wide range of targets from 240 as an ICES report up to 681 on the North Esk. An educated guess is that the requirement is around 500 to 700 eggs per 100 square metres for a reasonably productive tributary like the Gala Water. We can then transpose those deposition estimates or predictions um, to the stream bed area so for 500 eggs say we need 
1,800,000 eggs and if we go to the North Esk estimate which is 681 eggs per 100 square meters we need just about two and a half million eggs then we can compare it to our totals estimated totals here's the totals ranging from around six million in 2008 down to just just below three million in 2012 when we compare the egg deposition to uh, a target of 500 eggs we get a surplus in every year of at least one and a half million or sorry one million one hundred thousand in 2012 if we go for a higher target of 700 eggs per 100 square meters it gets a bit closer in 2013 but we still have uh, a surplus normally of around a million eggs or more in some cases nearly four million eggs so this this provides us with reasonable evidence that we have a surplus of fish spawning in the gala water every year the question then is whether we can do spawning targets for the tweed. This is the holy grail of fisheries management and that's what, they, what has been done in various countries uh, throughout Europe and has been attempted in Scotland and England but with fairly limited success. And this is down to the complexities of um, salmon, juvenile salmon dynamics and requires a very brief explanation of these challenges. The simple stock recruitment relationship, you might expect that as stock numbers increase, the number of adults coming back to spawn, you get a straight line relationship with the numbers of juveniles in the river. This is not the case in nature with any biological species and the general concept is carrying capacity that as the stock size increases, numbers of juveniles increase up to a point where the numbers of adults does not influence the numbers of juvenile fish. You have what's called the ceiling there and the circled in red. Unfortunately it's not as simple as that and what we actually have is a downward curve that as the number of adults increases to say that point there of a thousand adults that the lots of juvenile fish uh, produced and they compete with each other to their detriment and the numbers of smolts then actually decreases from the system and this has been shown on various different rivers such as the North Esk. If we want to define our stock recruit relationship for the Tweed we'd have to spend 15-20 years doing so to define the points uh, between adults and numbers of juvenile fish and then we would be able to define a point which is called the maximum sustainable yield, the largest return for a minimum number of adults. So at the moment, the holy grail of spawning targets for the tweed is something that we don't have, but maybe technology and science will move on and allow us to do that. So we leave you just with a picture of a salmon as it was measured 110 centimetres. It was recorded through the Wittadder counter in 2013. Uh, this fish would have got past all the anglers and there wasn't any record of it being caught upstream, but certainly trophy species, uh, a trophy fish that would have been worthy of the Malik trophy. This fish would have kept be carrying, if it was a hen fish, uh, would certainly have been carrying more than 20,000 eggs and would certainly produce many juvenile fish.